You have 11 mute messages. All right. Steven, it's Mom. Give me a call. I'm still your mother, you know. Hey, Stevie, this is Mr. Burger. Got another Art 101 coming at you. Hey, 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 Stevie. I got an Art 101. I don't know that you saw it. It's on Diego Velasquez. Check it out. Stevie, what are you doing? Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist, master educator, attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like the video, please interact with it. Much appreciation to past, present, future subscribers and interactors. You're all welcome, and I appreciate you being here. First thing in the morning, we're heading for the mountains. Now, you might not have noticed, but I've got a pretty extensive tie collection. This tie I picked up in Madrid, Spain, as a matter of fact. And when I was in Madrid, one of the artists that really stood out to me as a master, and he stood out to many of the others that came after him, was an artist by the name of Diego Velasquez, a master Baroque painter who really changed the shape of Spanish art. Let's spend some time today looking at the master, Diego Velasquez. Diego Velazquez was born to middle-class parents in Seville or Sevilla, Spain. Although they weren't real wealthy, Diego's parents believed that his education was the greatest of importance and they would sacrifice many things for him to have a well-rounded education. He studied Latin and philosophy but soon began painting under Francisco Herra the Elder. Although Herra was an excellent educator, Velasquez would soon move on to the studio of Francisco Pacheco. Now, Pacheco was not only an artist, but he also worked as a religious art inspector who had unquestioned authority over the arts in and around Sevilla, one of Spain's largest cities. I have a sword, huh? That's right, and people must respect it. Well, that should be fine, just fine. Fine, just fine. Fine. Velasquez studied under Pacheco for a nine-month trial period and at the age of 12 committed himself to a five-year apprenticeship. During this time, Velasquez was supplied with a bed, food, and an exposure to art that would shape his abilities for the rest of his life. On April the 23rd, 1618, Velasquez would marry his teacher's daughter, Juana, when he was only 18 years old. Eventually, the couple would have two daughters, however, one would sadly pass away in early childhood, but it was at the time of their marriage that he was able to practice as a painting master in Sevilla. As Velasquez's style would develop, he would become more and more considered a Rubenist, this is one who follows in the artistic footsteps and an admirer of the painter Peter Paul Rubens, a fellow Baroque painter. Of the 130-some paintings attributed to Velasquez, 96 of those are portraits. Who really cares, man, huh? And not only was he a follower of Rubens, but the two were also very good friends, and Velasquez would seek the advice of Rubens on several occasions. Beyond that, Velasquez's art was also influenced by the paintings created by Titian and Michelangelo Caravaggio. As the greatest follower of Caravaggio, Velasquez incorporated his techniques of adding light and shadow to add drama into the paintings known as Curioscuro. Rubens, Titian, Caravaggio, and even Velasquez are known for painting people as the primary subject in most of their artworks. They painted the rich, the poor, groups, and even themselves. Now there are so many great works by Velasquez that he created over his lifetime that it's really hard to talk about all of them. Side note, the Prada Museum in Madrid, Spain has about 50 paintings that were created by Velasquez. So if you love Velasquez's work, you need to visit the Prado in Madrid, Spain. I got something planned for your wife and kid that they ain't never gonna forget. 
A great example of his early work was the Adoration of the Magi. It was originally created for a Jesuit novitiate of San Luis in Sevilla. The curioscuro and the rendering of each object is exceptional in this artwork, and the details could be so exceptionally done because perhaps this was a family portrait. Being a young up-and-comer, he may not have had a lot of extra money available to hire models. Using his own family to set in this painting may have been a conscious choice. So, for whatever the reason, he got his father-in-law to play the gray-bearded king. He used his wife to sit in as the portrait of Mary. He would create a self-portrait as the young king. And his daughter would be used to play the part of Jesus. Wow. Wow. <sighs> As time passed, his working subject matters would shift from religious to royal. Because of this shift, he would create less religious art subject matter paintings than any other Baroque Spanish artist. Another great example of Velázquez's work in the area of portraiture is this one of Juan de Perea. This portrait was painted as Juan de Perea himself sat as the model for the painting to be created as Velázquez was preparing for a portrait done of the Pope. De Perea was a accomplished painter himself, however, he was also a slave literally owned by Velázquez. And although he may have learned many things from his time with Velázquez, and he was even allowed to get some training in Sevilla, he was still very much a slave, and all that that entailed. The work was displayed at the Pantheon, and this work alone earned Velázquez an election into the Roman Academy. With the completed painting in hand, de Perea was given the task of taking this painting around with him as a quasi-traveling art exhibit to show off his master's skills. In a more close to modern context, this work would gain a lot of press in 1971 when the Metropolitan Museum of Art bought the work for a record-setting $5.5 million. That might be a new record. It should probably also be noted that Velázquez did grant Perea his freedom and his blessing to go out and create and become an artist on his own. You're nauseating. All right, 1621. Philip IV was only 16 years old and had just become the king of Spain. A chief minister of the king, Conde Duque de Alevaras, who would eventually also become prime minister, was very knowledgeable about art and Velázquez's work in particular. In 1622, during Velázquez's first visit to Madrid, he was invited to the residence of the king. Philip IV was very impressed with Velázquez. The following spring, Velázquez returned to paint portraits, including his first of King Philip IV of Spain, and he was officially hired as an employee of the king on October the 6th, 1623. Velázquez was recognized as a genius, moved his family to Madrid, where he was paid a salary plus a bonus for every work that he would create. Philip IV was remembered as a great leader who helped Spain advance in the areas of art, literature, and science. The relationship between the king and artist grew out of the lessons that Velázquez would have learned from the stories of Titian. When working with royalty, make the best of their features while minimizing their flaws. Also, because the king wanted to help Velázquez develop into the world's greatest artist, the king, at the encouragement of Rubens himself, would send Velázquez on several trips to Italy to improve his skills. Being the perfectionist he was, he was excited at the opportunity to improve. Here's the deal, I'm the best there is, plain and simple. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I piss excellence. On these trips, he also brought works back for the king's royal art collection. As alluded to, Velázquez had several assistants to aid with his work, but in a bit of an ironic twist, he actually created a smaller number of works over his career, having painted only about 120. As an official of the Spanish royal court, Velázquez first travels to Rome, Italy in August of 1629. 
This trip would last about a year, where he stayed at the Vatican Palace until 1631. His return to Spain was soon met with the marriage of his daughter, Francisca, to Juan Batista Martinez del Mazo, who became Velasquez's disciple and chief assistant. This job would change as Velasquez's job assignments also changed. The king would name him assistant to the superintendent of the works, where he was given the job of remodeling the Royal Alcazar of Madrid, or the Antiguo Alcazar. This fortified castle was built in 1537, but the exterior and royal living quarters needed updating. As can happen, all of the work done on this building by Velasquez was destroyed in a 1734 fire, and a new palace was built in its place. However, nothing could replace the collection of over 500 paintings that were destroyed. One of the salvaged works from that fire was Velázquez's most known and recognized work, Las Meninas, or the Maids of Honor, which was first simply titled The Picture of the Royal Family. This work is centering on the theme of Princess Margarita and her playmates commissioned after her designation as the next heir to the Spanish throne by her father, King Philip IV. Within the work, it strongly revolves around light. For the 57-year-old Velasquez, the light made the color, and this is why there are so many types of light in the work. It is said that he painted in an a la prima technique and without any preliminary sketches. And this work has a striking composition that is set in a room that uses a one-point perspective. The bulk of the left half of the painting is dominated by Velasquez's self-portrait. Now, he's not the first artist to immortalize himself as a major character in an important piece of artwork. He was influenced by Phidias and Titian, who also did such things in their works. The artist is historically as exalted as the royal figures themselves. Velasquez has the key to the royal chamber painted on his belt and the cross of the Order of Santiago placed on his shirt to show his high position in the court. Oh, all right. He was given the title of Knight of the Order of Santiago on November the 27th, 1659. This is three years after creating this painting. Velasquez became obsessed with his positioning in the royal court. Now, this may be due to his numerous royal court duties, but he would wear the high-collar ruffles to breakfast and enjoy public floggings and took part in in many of the perks that this position held for him. Now as one looks at this particular painting, in the front right we see a large Spanish mastiff with a male dwarf, Nicolaso Prusato, who is resting his foot lightly on the back of the dog. Beside him is a female dwarf, Mari Barbolta. After his return from Italy, Velasquez would paint many of these so-called people of pleasure that provided entertainment to the royals. They became some of his most favorite subjects to paint. Oftentimes, they serve as an allegorical piece to the story. Most works like this one without a symbol fused into the content is very rare. Now, near the center of the work, we see Princess Margarita with the light casting down on her blonde hair and the silk dress. At her right, in a kneeling position, is an assistant to the queen, Maria Augusta Sarmiento, who is offering a drink on a tray. The second girl on the princess's left is Isabel del Velasco. Now behind the girl and the dwarf is an older nun. She is Marcella del Ulola, the lady of honor. And there's a man that she's having a conversation with. In the back of the room is Jose Naito the palace marshal to the queen, who is in the doorway beginning to walk up the stairs. On the back wall, King Philip and Queen Mariana can be seen stepping into the room through the mirror. So we are actually seeing this painting through the perspective of the king and queen's eyes. Allowing this perspective shows the king's respect for Velasquez and the artist as a professional. The mirror is a highly noted source of truth because mirrors never lie, and the mirror itself is also a symbol of the sense of sight in the visual arts. Megan, no! Look away! 
The mirror on the wall is accompanied by two large paintings. Both of these paintings were created by Peter Paul Rubens, Minerva punishing Arachne, and Apollo's victory over Marcius. They are both symbols of divine sources of artistic expression. This painting was executed in Velasquez's workshop in the Royal Palace and is a lasting example of his total command of painting technique and his genius at representing life and atmosphere to compose a complete visual experience. That's amazing art. I didn't realize how much of an accomplished artist he was, you know? Eighteen years after his first visit to Italy, Velasquez was sent back on royal business. Traveling out of Malaga, he reaches Italy in March of 1649. His task was to buy paintings and sculptures, as well as to hire fresco painters to paint the inside of the royal Alcazar. He would stay in Rome for a year and five months. It was during this time that he would create a portrait of Pope Innocent X, a work that was greatly influenced by El Greco's portrait of the Cardinal Fernando Nino di Guevara. It is said that when the Pope first saw the work, he exclaimed, It's too real. This is an example of Velasquez using color to create form. The lines between the Pope and his throne-like chair, or the chair and the curtain, do not exist. The colors make the edge appear. Side note, this is the last painting that Velasquez ever signed. What? So, Velasquez returned home to Spain after a three-month-long journey in June of 1651, even though the king asked him to come back in February of 1650, so he's a little bit late. Anyway, the king, Philip IV, began to see Velasquez as a calm and slow worker, but he produced results, so he would cut him a little bit of slack. It was not only his artistic skills, but his character and abilities at managing court business that greatly appealed to Philip IV. In the summer of 1660, Velasquez would be traveling with the king in France. It was in June and warm, and he was tired from his work on the road. On July the 31st, feeling feverish, he would return to Spain, where the royal doctors said that he was in critical condition. Days later, Velasquez died of a severe fever, but his legacy would live on. He has been called by many modern artists, including Salvador Dali and Pablo Picasso, and many, many others, as the greatest Spanish artist ever to live. And his art continues to live and inspire us to this day. I hope you enjoyed that story as much as I appreciated telling it to you. Thanks for coming in, and we'll see you on the next one. Well, Jesse... I guess we gotta find some other way to spend our evenings.